it was a hellhole. It was a death trap. Seeing this orange wall of fire, it felt like seeing a monster. Bob Mulet, an artist, and Max Orr, who's the creative director of the Art Collective inside the warehouse, made it out of the fire safely, thank goodness, and they join us now from Oakland. Bob, Max, I appreciate you being with us on what is an incredibly difficult morning for you. Bob, let me start with you. I understand you suffered some burns. First and foremost, how's your health this morning? Uh, physically, I'm alive. <laughs> and where were the burns, Bob? Uh, on my arm, my, my hand, I had a blister on my shoulder. Um, if I wasn't wearing my vest, uh, my whole back, my whole the whole back of my wow. So that that's charred. Uh, the back of your vest is charred from the from the flames. Yeah, if if I didn't have this vest on while I was pulling out Pete, um, I don't know. It would have been me too, probably. You know. Bob, tell me about Pete. Uh, we heard you mention him in our piece there. Uh, a friend of yours, somebody who lived in the collective with you, who you tried to rescue. Tell me about that experience. Um, you know, I, after finding an extinguisher and uh, it not working, I ran to go get my camera from my space. And on the way to my room, I, I saw Pete on his floor. He's a larger gentleman, you know. He, he must have broken his ankle while coming down from his loft in his space and he needed me to pull him out and as I, I tried my best and there was just stuff in the way, some, some stuff had fallen and it was just, it was, it was hectic. I mean, it's, that, that thought of him in there, just like it's, it's in my brain. You know? Max, you were, as the creative director, you were working the door on Friday night. Can you describe what the scene was like in the place before the fire and then what you saw as the fire broke out? Um, prior to the fire, there was, um, I believe, around 70 people or so uh, in the venue enjoying the music at the time. Um, I was downstairs. I heard someone sort of offhandedly say, is that a fire? And it wasn't said with a severity that rang, but then a second later, someone else said fire and we were all, I headed in that direction. I saw uh, an orange glow coming from the back of the warehouse and I immediately ran and grabbed a fire extinguisher. I ran back, I got, you know, maybe one squirt out of it and I realized it wasn't gonna do anything. The roof had already caught and the flames were coming forwards towards the door. I had, an alarming rate. It took about 15 seconds to go from mm. notification of a fire to completely engulfed. Max, based on what you saw or maybe what you've heard from fellow survivors in the last 24 hours or so, do you have any sense of how this fire may have started? Um, fr from what I've been hearing, it sounds like it was an electrical fire. Um, that's 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 what it sounds like at this point. There's been a lot of information floating around, and I'm just trying to make sense of it. And the fire department has said, Max, that there were no sprinklers, no smoke alarms, no exit signs, things uh, like that. Was that is that true? Uh, there are no sprinklers in the building. There were none installed in there um, prior to us getting the warehouse. Um, it was kind of an as-is basis, including the electricity. We tried to be in communication with the landlords and they were not very helpful with us throughout the entirety of our struggle with the electricity here. So that's, you know, my first instinct is to think that perhaps some of the building's mm. wiring had something to do with this. And quickly, Max, did you communicate those concerns to the landlord at any point before this fire? The, the landlord has been in communication with both myself and the owner of this space for at least three years now and the electricity was uh, a major issue prior to my coming aboard. I know that they had had some talks over it, but it was never fully resolved and uh, not resolved in the appropriate channels. Max and Bob, I'm so sorry for what you guys have been through. I'm so sorry for the loss of your friends. Let's hope for the best on some of those missing. And I really appreciate you being with us this morning on what's a very, very difficult time. Thank you so much.
I haven't seen him and there's been flames shooting out of the building for the past 30 minutes, so I hope he's okay. Sarah Kalmana is the man who ran the so-called ghost ship. He is at the scene of the fire this morning and joining us now. Mr. Almana, good morning to you. Good morning. Yeah, 36. It's not a good morning. I, I'm, it's not a good morning. What am I doing here? Can I just say I'm sorry? Can I just say... The only reason why I'm here is to put my face and my body here in front. Mr. Almana, let me ask you a couple of questions. 36 lives were lost in that building over the weekend. The, the family members of those who were lost want answers. They want to know who should be held accountable for their loss of their loved ones. Are you the man who should be held accountable? Am I the man who should be held accountable? Did I build something that... With the, with the, I mean, what am I going to say to that? Should I be held accountable? I can barely stand here right now. But it's a, it's a fair question, Mr. Amina. Obviously, there were some conditions in that building that may have led to a dangerous situation and led to what happened I laid, there. I, I laid my body down there every night. We laid our bodies down there. We put our children to bed there every night. We made music. We created art. We opened our home. What became our home, it didn't start off as our home. It started off as a, an initial dream, an idea that we would have a facility and a venue that would host everything from at-risk youth to the gay community to artists that couldn't perform anywhere to, to performance art and alternative arts and and eventually, when you can't pay your rent because what your, your dream is bigger than your pocketbook, when the need for housing, when the need for people to be able to sit down and be warm and make food and take a shower and take a bath and go to bed. And so we created something together, you know? This stopped being me. This wasn't about me three years ago. I signed a lease and I got a building that was to city standards, supposedly. And I was lured into something that I had to constantly... Mr. Almana, it may have been a dream, and, and all of that may be true. You provided a space for some people to live, but it, according to the city, it was not under code. And we have someone who lived there, an artist who lived there for two years, Shelly Mack, and she said she rented a space from you, that you knew it was dangerous, that you profited from this, and never spent a dime on anything but partying. What did you do I to ensure talk, this? I mean, I don't want to talk about. It. I don't want to talk about me. I don't want to talk about profiting. This is profit. What can you tell me you did life? to ensure like, the safety of I'm those people? I'm a father. I laid my there. I laid my three children down there every night. We understand profit? that. This is not profit. This is loss. This is a mass grave. So for the families, can you? I'm only here to say. I'm only here to say one thing: that I am incredibly sorry, and that everything that I did was to make this a stronger, more beautiful community and to bring people together. People didn't walk through those doors because it was a horrible place. People didn't seek us out to perform and express themselves because it was a horrible place. Nobody I'm 47 is, uh, Ms. years old, I'm the father of this space. Mr. Almond, and no one is saying it was a and horrible on the night, place, but and people are- On the are... night of the fire, on the night of the fire, did I know there was going to be a fire? Did I remove my children from the space and get a hotel because I wanted to avoid this? Because I wanted to cast blame on other people? No, because I wanted to get a good night's sleep with my children. Mr. I don't Almana. want to let the young people do what they needed to do. I'm not going to answer these questions the way that you're presenting them. What, what? Mr. Almana, I didn't do anything ever in my life that would lead me up to this moment. Can I ask you I'm if you are? I'm an honorable man. I'm a proud man. No, I'm not going to answer are these you, questions on this level. Are you level. worried that I'd you will be charged? I'd rather get on the floor and be trampled by the parents. I'd rather let them tear at my flesh than answer these ridiculous questions. Mr. Almond, I'm so we'll, we'll, sorry. I'm incredibly sorry. What do you want me to say? I'm not going to answer these questions. Then we will, we will call I'm this. I'm just going to say that I am sorry. Then we'll end the interview there, Mr. If you have to hold Mr. my Almana. soul accountable, if you have to hold my soul accountable for believing in something, 
Well, we appreciate your and time this Lou morning. Lurini and other artists and other beautiful people that also believe with me in fact. Our we district attorney, Nancy O'Malley, did activate a criminal investigation. We have located and recovered 36 victims. Shortly after I moved in, the transformer blew. Um, and we had no electricity, and I was asking, well, how come we're not calling PG&E? Well, that's when I found out it was an illegal hookup to PG&E. People have been wondering if you have anything to say to them. They're my children. They're my friends, they're my family, they're my loves, they're my future. What else do I have to say? Our records didn't show that an inspector had been inside the building in the last 30 years. We will not scapegoat city employees in the wake of this disaster. We will never see them again. And uh, we just want justice. Newly released documents from the city of Oakland show several city agencies, including the police department, visited the ghost ship warehouse dozens of times in the months and years leading up to last December's deadly fire. Almena and Harris knowingly created a fire trap with inadequate means of escape. They then filled that area with human beings and are now facing the consequences of their actions. The report reveals because of the extensive damage, investigators don't know what started the fire. It was another emotional day in court. Leah Danielle Vega was on the witness stand most of the day. She was a ghost ship resident who described the ghost ship as a stone hut, saying the building was not intended for humans. This is one of several Oakland PD body cam videos obtained by our media partner, the Bay Area News Group. In this clip, you can hear one of the officers describing the warehouse as a huge fireplace. More than a year before, the ghost ship burned down. I'll be so worried about all the electrical wires. The two men who ran the warehouse struck a deal with the DA today. Derek Almena got nine years, but will likely serve three and a half, while Max Harris got six, but should be out in less than two years. We just wanted some, some justice, some fair justice. You saw what occurred, which was wholly unexpected. Alameda County Superior Court Judge James Kramer rejected the ghost ship fire plea deal. Well, he has never been remorseful at all. Almena's actions appear to play the largest role in the judge rejecting the joint plea deal. We'll be going after the landlord, the slumlord. To investigate Brooks Shiro's first question, choreing a year and a half ago, and since then, Brooks, you've been keeping tabs on, on where she is and what she's doing. That's right, and following that, she lawyered up and she hired a crisis management team. She was also set to receive a $3 million insurance payout after that fire. And the clock is ticking because prosecutors only have until this December, three years since the tragedy, to criminally charge any member of the Ng family. Because then the statute of limitations runs out. Why aren't they defendants in this case? Why weren't they arrested? And of course the answer is, is that our clients are being made scapegoats. Frustrated, defense attorneys for ghost ship master tenant Derek Almena and creative director Max Harris demanded a citizen's arrest, calling for warehouse owners Chor Ng, her daughter Eva, and son Kai to face criminal charges for the 36 people who died at their warehouse in December 2016. The Ng family are a family of people who put saving money and making money over the protection of lives. Ms. Ng, Brooks Stroh's two investigates. Do you hold yourself at all responsible for what happened at the ghost ship? Two investigates tracked down the owner one year after the fire. She has never spoken publicly. The judge recently rejected the defense's motion for a citizen's arrest, but it didn't stop the attorneys from serving subpoenas to the Ng's. Eva and Kai made their first court appearance in April. Did you expect to come to court? Records show Eva Ng signed her name as the landlord in the 2013 lease agreement with tenant Derek Elmena. And emails from Elmena show Kai was told of the ongoing electrical issues months before the deadly fire. But when called to the stand, both Eva and Kai pleaded the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. The district attorney's office has never criminally charged them.
what they've done is they have allowed those people to flee. In essence, they've allowed those people to hide behind uh, a team of attorneys and law firms so that they can't be reached, so that we can't bring them into trial. What about the families? Don't you feel you're responsible? You own that place. Don't you have anything to say? Chor Ng has stayed low profile. In court, lawyers explained she had left the country for China, but two investigates found she's back. We're showing up at her house to see if she wants to say anything. And refusing to answer her door. Even Oakland City Council member Noel Gaia was surprised she's still walking free. He represents the Fruitvale District where the dilapidated ghost ship sits. The one that's ultimately responsible is the property owner. She knew exactly what was going on in this building. Code violation notices were sent to Chor Ng for hazardous conditions and life-threatening safety over the years, but the city never followed up. And this invoice obtained by two investigates shows the Ng's were made aware of an electrical fire two years before the tragedy. Still, nothing was done. Both Kai Ng and Eva Ng had violated their duties. Uh, these things, if they hadn't been done, if they had followed what they were lawfully required to do, would have prevented the ghost ship fire from happening. So we've learned the Ings will not be called to testify at trial. The defense now says they have enough witnesses to point at the Ings and believe Elmena will explain how the Ings were negligent when he testifies later this month. Well, that'll be interesting to hear what he has to say. Could the Ings be forced to testify in a civil case? So they are named in the civil case, which means that those attorneys that are prosecuting them will be able to depose them. But the problem is they're going... They, anticipate that they would plead the Fifth Amendment right now. They're going to wait for that statute of limitations to run out, and then they'll be able to ask them whatever they want, knowing that they can't be criminally charged, and they can use that information in the civil case. And that runs out, the statute of limitations, at the end of the year, December. Right, December 2nd, which will be three years since the tragedy. Do we know why uh, the district attorney has chosen not to file charges against the Ng family? The district attorney has remained very, very quiet, in fact, silent on this issue since before the trial. They could actually go and still charge the Ings from now until December. They said they were looking into it, but at this point, we don't have one indication, one way or the other, whether that's going to actually happen. We'll All right. be going after the fire department. We'll be going after Child Protective Service. We'll be going after the sheriff. We'll be going after Oakland police. It was certainly an intense intense beginning to, you know, the trial. Somberly, prosecutors went through the names and the photos of the 36 people who died on December 2nd, 2016. He's been in custody for two years. Uh, waiting to tell his story. Harris calmly addressed the jury. I think the worst thing he could have done for his own case was to open his mouth. I thought he started beautiful. The long-awaited testimony of Ghost Ship founder Derek Almana began with long periods of silence. He became emotional when asked by his attorney if he felt responsible for those who died at the ghost ship. Quote, I'm spiritually and morally responsible for it. He speaks around his answers. He tries to negate what he has said in the past. I speak on behalf of District Attorney O'Malley and the entire District Attorney's Office and this team of fine professionals who tried this case. Uh, today, of course, the jury did come back with not guilty verdicts against Max Harris. Uh, we respect the decision of the jury and the fact that uh, they worked so hard over this length of time in which they were away from their families and their jobs as they took on their civic responsibilities of being trial jurors. Since the beginning of this case, our hearts have been with the families of the 36 victims that died in this unspeakable tragedy. That still remains our focus, and that will be our focus going forward. As we go forward, and we understand that the jury had a split verdict or a hung jury against Mr. Almina, we are going to evaluate the facts and the evidence that came out from this case. We're going to take into account uh, discussions that 
any jurors may have had with our trial lawyers, and we will evaluate that and go forward. Um, I think it is important for me to point out that uh, there has been an incredible amount of hard work on behalf of these three prosecutors here, Autry James, Casey Bates, and Stacey McCormick, and our team of investigators and victim ad witness advocates that continue to work with the families. As we go through the process and on this waiting for the verdict, this was extremely difficult for the family members to accept. But the verdict is in against Max Harris. We are going to evaluate our prosecution as we go forward against Derek Almina. And in, because it is a pending case, we really have no further uh, things to say. Peter is hoping the third time is the charm in their effort to convict ghost ship defendant Derek Almena. His new trial is set for next March, and after the last jury deadlock, KPX 5's Don Land reports the defense also wants another chance in court. Don? Chelsea Dolan is one of 36 people killed in the ghost ship fire. I asked her mother today, Colleen, another trial. Are you tired? She said she's beyond tired but nothing can stop her from fighting for her daughter. I am completely emotionally wrung out. Um, I, I feel um, stronger now because we've had these few weeks off um, and I expect I will feel stronger when the next trial begins. And I will be there as an advocate for my daughter and that is very important to me. All the victims' families say they're mentally exhausted, but they want a new trial and they're ready. As grieving parents, yes, of course we are. The defendant, Derek Almena's wife, says she too is strained. I'm tired. I'm really tired. I'm okay. sad. I'm, you know. Micah Allison says her three kids hope they can soon hug their father. They miss their father. My kids miss their father. They haven't been able to hold um, his hand to touch him at all. She acknowledges their pain cannot compare to the families who lost sons and daughters. Last month, a jury acquitted co-defendant Max Harris and deadlocked on Elmena 10 to 2 in favor of finding him guilty of manslaughter charges. Prosecutors believe in the new trial, they can get a unanimous guilty conviction. The defense says no way. Our case is stronger. We're confident in the next trial we will prevail. Almeida is facing up to 39 years in prison. Colleen Dolan says she faces a lifetime of grief. I miss her every day. I miss her every night. I think about the fire every day and every night. And I do want the man who is responsible to be held accountable. The judge denies Almena's bail reduction request. That amount remains at $750,000. He'll likely stay in jail until the trial begins on March 30th.